Yeah, Rob and I have been talking for a long, long time as things have evolved. Sync Screen started about uh, just under three years ago. I think I've probably known Rob about as long as that as well. And uh, this is a great opportunity for us to put the two things together in a way. Um, and in fact, Eduardo has created uh, a very basic demo, which I believe is up there, uh, to, to show how our synchronization engine can work with the conductor platform to to take the experience from one screen to, to an app, for instance. So, sync screen, uh, just to get everybody quickly up to speed, the sync part of this is all about a technology called audio watermarking. Uh, this is where you take pre-recorded video, or in fact, the, the WAV track on the video, and you embed it with uh, time codes. And then you create a detection facility in an app that listens for those time codes and then the creative clever people will trigger something some event that will happen in the app at exactly the same time as that time code comes through on the content on the telly so the synchronization is from screen to screen uh, which is why we called it sync screen uh, really it's not sync screens it's sync screen because the screen that we're talking about is the mobile screen that's the one that we're syncing content with. Um, two and a half years ago, that seemed like a clever idea to call it sync screen, but obviously it narrows what the, the potential of this technology is, because actually, as I've just said, it's actually the WAV or the, the audio track that you're uh, embedding with the technology, the time codes. So we're already getting into projects where people are asking us if we can sync with something that's not a screen. Uh, for instance, an inanimate object like a, a child's toy. So taking the software onto a, <coughs> uh, an SOC, onto a chip. So we're looking at how we do that. We've had other people that have got um, public services where there's a pre-recorded audio stream playing out, say, in a museum, and somebody wants to have an app open and they can get extra information that's triggered by wherever they are in listening to the audio. So, and then there's obviously public broadcast, if there's pre-recorded um, messages. I think somebody else in another part of the world has created some system in the Japanese underground that if there's an earthquake warning uh, and there's a message comes out on the underground that, that if you've got this app open, you get a bit of an early warning. Don't know whether that's true or not, but I've been told somebody has done that. So sync screen really is not just about screens, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It's all about trying to bridge this creative divide between TV and mobile, what I've been hearing in the room today, and digital media. Um, here you've got the chance to create an audience experience. I'm unashamedly saying we've spent most of our time trying to make this happen in the TV world. Um, what I've been hearing here today is a lot of interesting and dynamic energy that, that Rob and I have talked about a lot. If we, we had just a fraction of this, in the TV industry, then I wouldn't be standing here pleading for people to get involved with this stuff and make it happen from the, the source, the creative source. So I've already said this, I'm not very good at I'm a bit like the guy who started this morning, I'm not that disciplined with the, with the slides. These are second screen. Right, where do I... Where? <laughs> Who knows what second screen is? Has anybody heard this phrase, second screen? It's a nice, easy, lazy term that the TV industry have created around the technology that links these two screens together, the TV screen and the mobile screen. And it's now, according to me, called so-called second screen. <laughs> And it has to be a phase that, that, that the creative industry helps us move on from. Because the psychology of second screen has led to a, a, a whole row of experimental apps that have allegedly been entertaining, amusing, whatever, um, for the user. But they've been largely fads. So you've got things like the Antique Roadshow, where it's saying it's a play-along experience. You've had all sorts of other things where they haven't really involved the user in the design of the experience. So when I say so-called second screen, we say it's not a consumer proposition because it hasn't been thought through from a consumer point of view. 
and there's now legions of blogs and everybody calling it second screen, I have to still pay tribute to that and call it so-called second screen just so people know what I'm talking about. So I even read somewhere that second screen has made it into the Oxford Dictionary or something. So I'm on a bit of an uphill challenge here to try and get the TV industry thinking about designing things that mean that the TV show itself isn't so precious that producers and editors won't let you do anything with it that would actually enhance and deepen the experience. So not a coincidence that currently under our logo we're talking about this being a deeper TV experience. It's not about doing something that's in competition with TV on the mobile. It's about enhancing a TV show so it's a deeper experience. And everybody in the room seems to get that from what I've seen this morning about having layered experiences. Um, it can't be a second screen experience because it doesn't trigger the emotions. You're not generally asking people to do anything that's thoughtful in the way that, that you've been talking and I've been here and enjoying this morning. Most of what is called so-called second screen is really about tapping a screen, yes or no, or trying to somehow bring social media. You know, the, the, the legend is everybody's sitting in front of the telly, multitasking, doing Twitter, doing Facebook. So let's do more of that. And what you're actually creating is a distracting situation for most people. And therefore, it's not a surprise that most of the success of so-called second screen has been on the big Saturday night shows that, that, that are just basically asking people, do you like this? Do you know, you know, vote along with X Factor and stuff like that. There's not a lot of thought there. They're trying to jump on the back of the fact, very successfully, by the way, so not knocking it, uh, that people are generally distracted during that sort of content. Well, we haven't started with that sort of content. We've really started with children's TV. So I just thought I'm coming to this creative brain fest. I'll try and be a bit creative here. I did write a blog piece on our website uh, about how Simon and Garfunkel can actually contribute to this debate about dual screen production in the TV arena. It's only a couple of paragraphs if anybody wants to read it, but bear with me. This is my little boring analogy, but I was watching this program uh, about a year ago, there's a programme called The Harmony Game, uh, made by this New York filmmaker for the BBC, uh, Jennifer Lebeau. And I'm sitting watching it and here you've got Simon and Garfunkel, who I have to say are my heroes, you know, from a long time ago, love their stuff. Paul Simon sitting in the back of a car with Art Garfunkel in about 1968, just saying, hey, I guess we're in the harmony game. And I suddenly thought, well, that's it. I can now talk about Simon and Garfunkel in these contexts. But everything about what he meant by that applies to what's not happening currently with most dual screen, two screen, companion screen, call it what you want, productions in TV. It's actually been more of a disharmony game. So if you can try and imagine what's happened to Simon and Garfunkel since they went their separate ways, you might all have a different view on that, but I don't think it's anything as good as it was when they were working together. Um, so here's the point. There's a big lack of imagination going on in the TV area because so-called second screens have surfaced this problem that there are no skill sets for this new world where you have digital media coming together with, well, mainly social media actually, coming together with TV. And we've been sitting in a number of developments with clients where you've got a digital team and a, and a TV team sitting arguing about how much activity there needs to be on the so-called second screen to make this a joint activity within their company. And then we keep saying it's TV. So TV prevails. What goes on on the uh, mobile screen has to be an enhancement of whatever the content's trying to get over. So we've actually had to mediate in meetings where you've got the digital media people saying, oh, wouldn't it be really neat to have, you know, on, on the app, all these Twitter feeds coming in about everybody's what... And, and then the TV guy saying, well, I don't want that because it's going to stop people watching my TV show. So we've ended up being like a, a court of, of arbitration in some of these discussions as the two things collide. So there's an imagination gap, and that's why I'm here today, is to try and appeal to the creative community to get involved in this. And I just wanted to get my face up there next to Simon and Garfunkel. 
<laughs> and plead and plead for a two-screen TV harmony game. And I did say this at an event about 18 months ago, and I put it up again today because I really do believe this: that if if it's distracting or confusing, it's not working from the audience point of view. I think I'm better looking than both of those two, by the way. <laughs> And then, uh, just to make the point about the documentary, it does go on in meticulous detail, all really excellent stuff about how they made Bridge Over Troubled Water, pushing all the boundaries in terms of using technology, experimenting with sound. It took 100 hours plus in 1969 for them to, to produce this uh, record, The Boxer, the one track. It got a lot of publicity at the time. All about attention to detail, experimentation, and all of the things I've listed there, which I believe are you know, true to this, this particular song, where they've made this great song into a great record. And that's really what I think this is all about, you know, getting content and making it into a great programme or a great experience. So, any of you have thought about Second Screen and thought, oh, that's all too difficult because the TV production companies are not kind of looking for it. Commissioners are playing with it, but they're not really, you know, giving it any play. Um, let's talk about this in the context of what I've been hearing big time today about adding extra layers to core narrative and that can sit across multiple devices. Uh, talking earlier about this whole one screen thing that, that that's, um, can happen in a web experience and that probably will come to TV in, in a few years time with connected TVs. But at the moment it's the mobile experience going with a with a bit of content that I think we're focusing on. I believe that if this is done properly, and I'm going to obviously blow our trumpet in a minute, we are um, doing a couple of things that we hope are creating best practice in this kind of area, which is mainly around play-along TV at the moment. You've got to believe that in the end you can help design and, and lead new audience behaviours. It's only when something becomes adopted behaviour that you get a change in, in the situation and that's what we're trying to so I didn't put the academic uh, sticker on here but I do feel I'm kind of lecturing a bit from an academic point of view we understand the creative industry needs to have editorial tools to enable this and so a lot of what we've been using uh, because we needed to create it for ourselves it's why we got into technology I'm not talking about us being a technology company but we do license technology but everything we talk about is getting the creative process done first, the technology works. We've, we've made sure that it works so that it's not an issue in delivering this stuff. So I won't go through all this now, but we, we have tools that we can, can help people with any bit of content, any bit of video, 10 minute bit of video, we can very quickly simulate a two screen experience so that people that you're trying to pitch ideas to get some sense of the pace of what might happen and what kind of events they might trigger at what times and that's really where we've got all of our successful commissions from. Um, we have been, uh, this, this was a prototype we did for a production company called Zodiac Media. It was a whole um, two screen experience for a children's program called Mr. Maker. I've got a quick video here just showing you that if you design this properly, this is part of some videos we did for child testing, uh, that you can actually get children quite comfortably doing uh, activities across two screens. We've had child psychologists looking at this stuff to make sure that at that age group you're not overloading them with too many things to do and all these things that parents worry about with their kids playing with gadgets. And it's beginning to show that, that rightly designed, this could be quite a fulfilling and deep experience which you know obviously could move into some other kind of educational areas in this area. Um, in this particular, these are a couple of things. We actually managed to get the app to um, simulate cutting by dragging and dropping. So you could put your finger on it, as you'll see, and that would actually cut. And the, 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 the premise of this was that the kid's actually making exactly the same picture that the guy's making in the studio, and he ends up with that picture on the iPad at, at the end of the show, and he, and he gets rewards for doing it accurately or quickly or whatever. So I'm going to try and show a video, I think. Do I just... This is where we film kids doing this. So 
So he's drawing round the thing at the same time as he's cutting that out. Let's cut it out very carefully. There's our thumb. So let's glue it in position. Now for the fun bit. Let's get some scraps of coloured wrapping paper. This is going to be an elephant. Let's start with a curvy body and a long trunk. Four legs. And of course, a funny tail. And we can draw the ears on a different scrap of wrapping paper. This will make our elephant look really colourful. Now let's cut all of our elephant parts out. I think you got the idea. I know we're running a bit late. I'll, I'll, um, how do I stop this one? What I'm going to do now is move to a very, from the, for the sort of very academic showing that kids really get this and probably that's a good thing for us in that we've started with people at an age where they're not really thinking about the technology, they're just doing what they think is natural, we've designed it so it is natural. We've taken that to a commercial uh, product with CBBC, we launched in uh, May a play along uh, app for a, a program called Gory Games, Horrible Histories. And um, I'm just going to show you very quickly here the trailer that they put out for that. It's literally you're playing along as a, as a fourth studio, uh, a fourth contestant, if you like, with the three kids in the studio. And um, you're answering the same questions at exactly the same time. They get asked them and you get exactly the same amount of time. I have got all this. If anyone is interested, I can load up and show the actual thing later. But. <laughs> The Marvel Histories quiz show Gory Games is back with added playability. <laughs> no more screaming at the telephone. You can now play along using our all new Gory Games free app for tablets and smartphones. Just make sure you have the app open whilst you're watching the show. It will connect up automatically and in seconds you can be taking on the studio contestants. Answer the questions correctly and you'll win virtual year spheres. Plus there are bonuses if you can predict who'll win in the time sewers. And if that's not enough, you can track your scores across the series and brag about your prizes and rewards. So don't be stuck in the dark ages. Get interactive with the Horrible Histories Gory Games Play Along app. Even Rattus understands it. So we are currently in the world of, of, as you've seen there, refreshing existing formats, which I said does have its challenges because these shows have normally been, this, this show had been finished, the whole series had been finished and we've had to go in and do a degree of re-editing with the shows to allow the time and pace for the, for the things to happen on the, on the, 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 the mobile screen. Um, really, I think the, the big high ground here is, and this is a, a plea out there, I mean, my, my business partner is a TV producer at Sync Screen. I think we'd be love, love to be having a go at some, some new two screen formats that, that, you know, we had the IP in rather than helping somebody else. But this has showcased us. The fact that the CBBC are using our framework, uh, they've used it on another app which we've licensed our API out to, which is, is one called Ludus, which came out before us. Uh, has won lots of awards through, through its gameplay and everything. We didn't design that one, whereas we designed all this. Um, this is the real important thing. The reason so-called second screen needs to be consigned history, because nothing that ever came out of that phase proved the business case for the investment in the technology to make formats interactive. It was all done a bit experimentally. Even with the BBC, which is non-commercial, as we know, this has been achieving 15%, and we think they've given us a low number, conversion rate. So that means that 15% of the audience that's watching a given episode is actually playing along with it. And uh, we've got their permission to use that figure publicly. 
they were expecting something around 5%. So we don't know where they get their norms from, but obviously this was, was vastly in excess of what they were expecting. Um, conscious of the time here, I'm not going to lecture you because I'm not actually the right guy at our company to talk about how you do all this stuff creatively, but we, we are looking to use the Simon and Garfunkel mode to create screens that are in harmony if it's screens. Um, and I've got a few things here which if, if this is all going to be packaged up and given out, you know, these are a few things that we've learned in doing what we're doing about how you do it. Um, and then just, just obvious stuff. If you're going to do a two screen editorial thing, and we've got some tools to help you do that, you have to, you have to plan it out exactly as I've seen in pretty much every example this morning. You have to go through exactly the same processes. Yeah, we, we, we found that like with Gory Games, what we missed out on at this time, because they didn't have the budget, but we could have done an offline game that could have kept the, the, the interest going between the episodes being broadcast. So what I'm seeing this, this morning, um, what I know from what Rob's stuff does, you know, that's exactly the territory where if you've got a TV show and you want to keep the audience engaged before the next one broadcasts, in the drama sense you can be giving lots of stuff that's going on, exactly what I've seen this morning, but, but you know, in the context of a TV series. Um, as I say, we do take this seriously, this, this cognitive load. We, we, we are being seen more and more as specialists in children's TV because of the projects that we're currently working on, but we're not only working in TV. We'd love to break out and get into some other more serious genres to show that this can work across all content. Uh, I won't bore with all this. Most importantly, as I say, we're partnering up <coughs> with, with Rob and Conductor. Uh, Eduardo's taken our uh, demo um, S SDK software kit and created a demo using the video they already had. Um, I haven't fully seen all of it. I saw it working on Wednesday. It was looking pretty good at that stage. Very basic demo just to show you the potency of using something that's working from one screen to the other. So they've got a test app that, that you can see that, you know, the, the, the guy in the, in, the, uh, in the video is communicating with the mobile. And hopefully you'll get a chance to have a look at that later. So thank you very much. Okay. Questions. Oh. Does anyone have questions for us? We have time for four minutes. Four minutes. Four minutes of questions. Sinking objects. Sorry. Talk a little bit more about sinking objects. We we currently have um, some work going on. It's not happening yet, but everybody can see the obvious. If you've got um, a kids show that's got a, a, a toy property. That if you can get the uh, you know the, the the lights to flash at the same time that it does on there, or you can get the toy to fill out some educational stuff. So we are looking to put our uh, software on a chip so that you can actually you know program that into a toy and get it to react in whatever way. So there's a whole creative process around. Well, what do you? Because we've had that conversation already. It's, it's where the tech takes people so far. So we'll, we now understand you can probably do that, although that tech's not quite there yet, we're getting there. But the, the issue is always, well, what would you get the toy to do that parents would pay more for it because it interacts with the show and, and you know, all of that usual stuff. So it's always back to creative. It's always back to creative. I take it that um, your device will sync whether it's played on a TV or if it's played on a computer or if it's... It Absolutely, yeah. That's, that's what I, I did actually with Rob's kind permission, change a few of my slides this, uh, in lunch break when I saw the, the general pattern of this morning and that's why I made the point about it's the audio you're synchronising with and unlike other synchronisation technologies uh, like these, these live shows that I'm talking about, if you're watching X Factor and you obviously all of the interactivity assumes that you're watching it as an event and it's a live you know event that you're watching with our stuff we've come more from the production end so that most tv production companies want to try and distribute their content across multiple territories so the synchronization the watermarking stays with the content so even if, if it goes onto a dvd or if it goes onto pvr or on catch-up tv once it's in the content it has to be taken out of the content for it, for it to not be there, if you know what I mean.
that was something I was really uh, curious about. Like, have you ever, um, you've just used this for um, the game shows, essentially? You haven't, or the, the kids shows, you, actually, you haven't used this for fiction or to actually tell stories? Sorry, you weren't listening. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> We 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 would we are crying out loud, keen to do all that. Because, but yeah, we no, no, because like just from the idea, from the fact that it's already in the audio, then you can, for example, just create something that adds an additional layer in the sense of that um, if you watch it with the app, then it changes the story in some way. Because that's why I'm here. I'm glad uh, that is exactly why I'm here. Because at the moment, it's all play along. We're a small company. We've had to go where these commissions are. My my partner had to work very hard to get these things commissioned by the BBC. We've got two other things I can't talk about, which will, one of them's not kids. Um, and they're just generally in the, I bracketed it as play along. It's generally the experience where people are being immersed in the action in, in these kind of programs. And they don't all have to be quiz program. We, we want the chance to show you can do it with something else. So I'm really glad you've asked that, but I'm a bit annoyed I didn't get my message over. <laughs> <laughs> No, we've looked at looked at things, and as I said, if I if I um, had some time, I'd like like my business partner to lock himself away in a room with somebody <laughs> and come up with a format that that was take this to the next level uh, in in a genre that's not so obvious. The thing is, you have to write the content Sorry? for the for that type of engagement. So the demo that we've put together, Len had already scripted and shot. Uh, a web, you know, like a web episode that was intended to be a two-screen, um, you know, experience. Yeah. And so we leave longer time on the first screen, we call it like that, yeah. so that you have an opportunity to look down at the mobile and then look up again. Yeah. And we're like looking at ways of saying, like, you know, you should now be looking at this screen. So you sort of go back and forth. So all of that kind of narrative design is is still in its infancy. Everyone's trying to think, well, how do we do that in a good way and, and, and add value to this two screen experience, then it would be better than just having a single screen experience. So that's I think that's that's why we don't see more of this. Not only just not getting access to the technology, but now, you know, there is access to the technology. And it was incredibly easy to use. So we uh, we had a, a film we sent uh, Keith the audio track, so we just from Adobe Premiere just output the audio, and then um, they sent it back encoded, and we just plopped that straight into uh, Premiere again and output the rendered movie, and then Eduardo built the app knowing where different things in the film timeline are supposed to pop up on the screen. So in our demo, the character in the in the film picks up a phone, and you get a phone call on your phone. So the trigger from sync screen goes to the conductor, tells the conductor send the phone but we needed a reason to use that app so we said well imagine if you're like an agent so you're like hacking into the system so when you get the phone you're kind of put you put your mobile number in and, and the whole device is in the story world yep. so all these things have to be considered to, to create something later well just one thing um with the gory games it's a very easy simple thing to say but i i'm, I'm assured it was quite a difficult thing to negotiate with the, the producer of the show but the, 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 the guy in the studio has to obviously repeat the questions twice when you're playing along. Because there's no point in just saying it and then waiting for the people in the studio to answer. So he, the questions come up and they come up the same time here. And simple thing, he reads the questions out again when you know the people's attention's here. And it's little things like that that you know, make a hell of a big difference in terms of the enjoyability of it and, and people coming back to play again. One final. <laughs> Just really quick, uh, I come from, I, I'm from the live performance and theatre world and I was wondering if there's um, a way of negotiating a licensing fee for you know uh, an industry that's a little bit less <laughs> uh, wealthy than, than the television industry because it seems that there may be possibilities to develop the narrative structures that, that will be more native to this kind of an yeah. environment. Yeah. No, I, I think I think one big part of my job, if 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 you you know get my card, it's got commercial director on it. One of the big problems has been whilst we've wrapped a framework around core technology, we we have to go to there's two or three vendors that actually got the core watermarking technology, and their pricing models are still a bit enterprise software. 
oh this is an early market we'll we'll charge that and when the volumes come through we'll come down but that ain't working so a lot of the arguments we have is if we get to the point where somebody might consider doing it and then you start talking about the extra cost of the interactive tech not not just any licensing we might want to put on but the core licensing it, it's become difficult but we are making progress because our platform has been deliberately designed to to take any of these vendors as a plug-in so we're, we're, we're kind of doing the car phone warehouse trick which i learned many years ago at motorola when i was one of their suppliers that they they you know they they were neutral in terms of the connections that they sold at the time at that time going back to an old model well we're the same so if we go to a broadcaster and they've already done a deal with one of these vendors uh, we can plug that in but it does mean i'm now getting to the point where you can play one off against the other if you've got a project and say well who wants this project you know we can plug any of them in so that's where where we are with that and we'd love to talk about what ideas you've got i don't want cost of this to be prohibitive to to moving forward so part of my day job really is to get these prices down at levels that can drive those volumes and that can only be done by a creative partner the the tech vendors can't do this directly they finally <coughs> learn that they can go out and pitch to broadcasters and get them interested in the tech but it only remains experimental broadcasters will always say well i haven't got a format to use that in so it's back to this world where, where do i get the creative format to to do this stuff with and then is there a benefit in doing it so, anyway, thank you. Thank you.